Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to our first 9.15 service we've had for several weeks with all the things changing around over East. It's lovely to have you with us and very special to have people joining us online as well. Welcome to you also because we've come together in the name of Jesus Christ, haven't we, to offer our praise and thanksgiving to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. And we're going to do that first of all by singing our first hymn this morning, which is Jesus Lives, Your Terrors Now Can O Death No More Appall Us. Let's stand and sing it together and worship the Lord as we do so. <coughs> So please do be seated as we come to our time of confession. <laughs> Jesus told us, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let's turn away from our sin and turn to Jesus Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith together, and the words will be on the screen. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done, and we have done those things that we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous, and godly life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image, 
to the praise and glory of his holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the special prayer for the Church of England for today. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continuously in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, before Colin comes to read God's word to us, we're going to stand and sing again a very short, simple song, Be Still and Know, the time God. It's good for us, isn't it, sometimes, just to sit and listen to the Lord's word and know that he is God. We'll do that first. So we'll stand and sing, and then Colin will come and read to us. Our reading this morning is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 21. I shall be reading from verse 1 to verse 14 and can be found on page 1090 in the Church Bible. John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. And this chapter is entitled, Jesus and the Miraculous Catch of Fish. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning... Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul their net in because of the large number of fish Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. 
Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. <coughs> Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. And as we come to our final in a quite a long series through John over the last few months, let's pray to God. Father, we thank you so much that we don't have to guess about you. For there were people who saw Jesus and who saw the amazing things that he did and that he said and wrote them down that we can have certainty, that we can have belief, that belief that leads to life. So as we come to this final chapter of John, we pray you might fill our mind's eyes with the glory of Jesus that would spur us on through the week. Amen. Amen. Well, John chapter 21, page 1090, verse 9. Imagine this scene. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Well, imagine the scene. On the one hand, nothing had changed. They had breakfast together countless times over the last three years, sitting around, chatting, planning. But of course, everything had changed. Jesus had died on the cross. He'd risen and appeared now three times to them. And now they sat around that fire, eating fish and bread. I wonder what it tasted like. The best, I imagine. I wonder what they talked about. I bet they had questions. Did Jesus make jokes or inquire about their families? Or was there a nervous sense of anticipation? When I was at theological college, there used to be this tradition right at the end of third year, after studying the whole of John's Gospel, the whole year would be taken outside to a fire pit and they'd have fish and bread for breakfast. It ended before uh, my chance at it, but I imagine what it was like as everyone prepared to set her out across the country, some even across the world, in the mission of Christ. Not only the culmination of a shared experience, but the nervousness of change and uncertainty. And these disciples, they knew something was changing. Something had changed. No longer was Jesus there in person with them 24-7. But what would the future be like? Well, this chapter of John is a bit like an epilogue to the gospel. It could have ended a few verses earlier. Chapter 20, verse 30. This sounds like quite a good ending, doesn't it? Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's a very important verse in the book. It's his purpose statement, and it's kind of finished. He set out the signs of Jesus. And then there's this extra chapter, because of course the story isn't 
finished. It's a bit like that bit right at the end of the film where the drama's done, the main drama's finished, but they have a snapshot of future life, the characters at home, what life will be like going forward. And in a way, that's we've got a lesson about this new stage, what the Bible calls the last days after the cross and empty tomb, before Jesus returns. What's it all about? Well, three things we'll see this morning. There's a great need, a great provider, and a great finale. So first, the great need of these last days of today. Let me read from verse 1. Afterwards, that's after his first two appearances, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, that's the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way, note the people included, Simon, Peter, who denied Jesus. Thomas, called Didymus, he's the one who doubted that Jesus had risen. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of Thunder, such was their liveliness. The two other disciples, I love this, they're not even named, just two other disciples, background figures, were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. Simon Peter often struggles to sit still. He always needs something to do. And they said, we'll go with you. I suspect perhaps just what the doctor ordered, a peaceful trip onto the lake after all they'd been through. So they went out. So far, so good. And got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now Peter, James and John, they were pro-fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They knew in and out all the equipment, how to use it, how to move the oars gently through the water so as to not disturb the fish, and how to cast the nets just right. But still, nothing. No food for breakfast, no stock for the market. And on the one hand, it's an entirely kind of physical and ordinary problem, except it's not the first time in John's Gospel that there's been a shortage of food. Can you remember, for instance, back to February in chapter 2, and a wedding which ran out of wine? The shame it had caused, but then the miraculous provision of a thousand bottles of the best red. Or chapter 4, which Roger Carswell spoke on. And an outsider woman, the Samaritan, going to the well for water at a time of day when she wouldn't bump into anyone except she bumps into Jesus. And Jesus knows she has a need, a deep spiritual thirst, demonstrated by her many husbands. And so he offers her living water, water that will well up within her to eternal life. Or then chapter 6, and a crowd of 5,000 plus hungry people. And Jesus takes the small five loaves and two fish and multiplies it and feeds them all with bountiful leftovers. But then the next day the crowd find him again and they want lunch. So he this time says no and says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never go thirsty. You see, the point is that in all these episodes, a lack of food or drink symbolised a deeper need, a spiritual need, a need ultimately for Jesus. That's the point of the seven I am sayings in John, if you know those. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, the vine. The point being that each is a picture of something we deeply need and for each Jesus says, I am the fulfilment of that need for you. And so as these disciples found themselves tired and fishless, did they remember? Did they remember with hungry tummies that greater hunger? 
that Jesus had taught them, a hunger for himself. I mean, they certainly knew it, as we'll see in a few verses' time. When Peter realises it's Jesus on the shore, he jumps out of the boat in excitement. He wasn't excited about breakfast. It wasn't for the smell of the frying fish that he leapt out of that boat. He was excited for Jesus. You know, we've no greater need in the whole world than our need for Jesus. If only I'd remember this, I'd spend more life-giving moments in his word than the life-draining moments scrolling on the phone. (laughs) I would make sure that every day began in his word, or if that's not possible because of the kids, that sometime feeding on Jesus, Jesus' food, food for the soul, And you know our children, or grandchildren, they've no greater need in the whole world than their need for Jesus. That a child who's never excelled at a hobby, never been in a sports team, never learnt an instrument, never been on a particularly special holiday, (coughs) never been particularly popular, even a child who's never even learnt to read or write, but who has a living relationship with their Lord Jesus Christ, isn't that child better off than one who has all the earthly hobbies and privileges and successes that you could conceive, but doesn't have Jesus? Do you believe that? Now last summer in Ecclesiastes, we learnt in the Old Testament that if you get your priorities in the right order, you can have both and flourish and it's good. But I guess I'm asking, do we as parents and grandparents want most for our children what they really need most? And do we demonstrate it in the way we structure their weeks, what they really need most? (coughs) Our neighbours, no greater need than Jesus. Our colleagues and families, no greater need than Jesus. The world needs Jesus. So that's the first thing, a great need, though a pretty daunting thing, isn't it? Because we do want Jesus, and we want our family and friends to know Jesus, but then we live in a world that's so full of multicolour distraction. So what do we do? Well, that brings us on to the second part of this snapshot, the great provider. So there they are, having fished all night long, Verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. I don't know why they didn't realise, perhaps he was too far away, perhaps it was misty, perhaps he looked a bit different, I don't know. But either way, he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. I mean, it's not really a complicated point. Without Jesus, no fish. With Jesus, loads of fish. In fact, uh, 153 fish, I think we're told. Uh, Lots of people wonder about this number 153. I don't think there's anything special about the number 153. I just think it's how many fish there were. Um, If I caught that many fish, I think probably I'd count them as well. (laughs) Anyway, there's lots of fish. But it's not just fish, is it? Because fish, it means something. John doesn't recall uh, this in his account, so I don't want to make too big a deal out of it. But for Peter and James and John, as they went through this. Well, it's a massive deja vu moment for them. It's back in Luke 5 when we're told about how Jesus called them to be disciples in the first place. It was also after a fruitless fishing expedition at night and then a command from Jesus to let down their nets and a miraculous haul of fish. And then after, Jesus says to Peter, don't be afraid From now on, you will catch people. 
It's mission, it's evangelism. Fishing for people. That was their job and it's still their job as he does it again. Fishing for people. But how are they going to get any? Any fish to believe and repent and follow Jesus? Or perhaps it's their skills of persuasion. Perhaps they're just so friendly and nice that people will just want to join them. Maybe they had a great strategy, a plan for the conversion of the world. But no, on their own, no fish. Now that's not to say that kind of strategies and resources are bad. In Western churches, we've got lots of good courses to use, books to give away, strategies to kind of think about, and that's good. But you know, there are churches in the world who don't have any of those resources, but they're growing because they have the one resource they actually need indispensably, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and prayer to the one who, as well as being the one that they need, is also the one who brings in the catch, whose words are words of eternal life, whose call can turn even the most stubborn sinner into the most joyful follower. I guess we could make another comparison. Better to be a poor, small, but praying church that Jesus blesses than a rich, powerful, but prayerless church whom Jesus passes by. So what will these last days be like? A great need, Jesus. A great provider, Jesus. And I bet you're already starting to think, you know, the third one is going to be about Jesus, isn't it? Like the um, Sunday school story of the boy who's asked what's grey and fluffy and climbs up trees and collects nuts for the winter and his hand shoots up and he says, Jesus! (laughs) Well, thirdly, the great finale of mission, of these last days. And let me just read simply those verses from verse 7. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. He wasn't going to meet his Lord in properly dressed. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they, had, they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Well, there's lots we could say about these verses, but there was one thing that particularly struck me as I was preparing. In a way, this chapter looks back, as we've seen, to what's come before. And it also looks to the present, our present task, their present task, fishing for people. But actually, in this image of Jesus on the shore, welcoming his disciples, I think it beautifully looks forward as well. For one day we too will approach Jesus through the stormy seas of life toward the shores of paradise. Our journey complete, our fishing complete. It reminds me of the Narnia stories and the voyage of the dawn treader. Perhaps you've read this or seen the film. And the Narnia books, they're all about Jesus. And this one ends with a boat sailing toward the end of the world, toward Aslan's country, heaven in other words. And the mouse, Reaper Cheap, is so excited. I love how C.S. Lewis describes what he can see beyond in Aslan's country. 
What they saw eastward beyond the sun was a range of mountains. It was so high that either they never saw the top of it or they forgot it. None of them remembers seeing any sky in that direction. And the mountains must really have been outside this world. For any mountains, even a quarter of the twentieth of that height, ought to have had ice and snow on them. But these were warm and green and full of forests and waterfalls, however high you looked. And suddenly there came a breeze from the east, tossing the top of the wave into foamy shapes and ruffling the smooth water all around them. It lasted only a second or so, but it brought both a smell and a sound, a musical sound. And then they come up against the shore of that world. What will we see and hear as we approach the eternal shores, I wonder? Or perhaps will we be too engrossed with the one that we see there? For it is not so much the place that is the finale, though wonderful it will be, but the person. It is Jesus waiting on the shore waiting all the time through the ups and downs of life, watching and waiting, providing and feeding, always attentive. But then one day we'll finally arrive and he will meet us. And you know, we'll, we'll haul our cats towards him, the efforts of our lives and our service, and we'll present it to him, and whether big or small, he'll receive it and take it and use it in glory. And we'll enjoy him as he welcomes us, not to a barbecue on a beach, but to his eternal banquet of joy. Praise be to Jesus. Our great need, our great provider, our great finale. Because that's what John's Gospel, he's who John's Gospel is all about. John wants us to see the signs, to see who they, what they point to about Jesus. And believe and have eternal life. I'll end with the words of Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Johnny, very much. Yes, Jesus is Lord, isn't he? And we're going to sing that now and recognize that just about everything that we see proclaims that. Jesus is Lord. Creation voice proclaims it. And yet Jesus came down here to help us and to make himself known to us and to be our saviour. Let's stand and sing together, Jesus is Lord.
there, so please sit or, if you prefer, kneel to pray. And join with me in the words in bold type that will appear on the screen. <coughs> Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the King and teach his counsellors wisdom. May your ministers be clothed with righteousness and let your servants shout for joy. Lord, make your ways known upon the earth. Let all nations acknowledge your saving power. Give your people the blessing of peace and let your glory be over all the world. Make our hearts clean, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Now Rob Gilbert is going to come and lead us more informally. Rob, come and join us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again we remember the conflicts raging across the world, whether in Gaza, Ukraine, Yemen or elsewhere. May swift resolutions be found for these conflicts, justice be served where required, and repentance for all those who require it. Defend the innocent and hold the guilty to account. And please allow aid to get through where it's required. And closer to home, as our country seems divided as ever this election year, we ask for understanding with each other, particularly within the ch our church, over differences of opinion on disputable matters. Whoever ends up in power, may bad laws contrary to your word be thwarted. We plead for spiritual renewal across the country that trickles up to those in power. And this week, Lord, we pray for our children and their Sunday school groups with tiny saints, small saints, super saints, SAS and WIN. Help them to grow up in the knowledge that you love them and direct their paths to follow you all the days of their lives, that with a living faith they may be brought to baptism and or confirmation to be lifelong followers of you. And we also remember the local schools we have links with, whether that be Leyland Primary, Buckland or Bishop Wand. Equip the staff and governors with sound wisdom to care for and teach the children for all decisions that have to be made. Protect them from unnecessary stress this summer term and help the children to readily adapt to normal routine after the holidays. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so we say together the words that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, if you'd like to look up for a moment, I have a pleasant duty of reading some bands this morning first. So, here we go. I publish the bands of marriage between Martin Lloyd-Jones of this parish and Jane Penelope Livesey of Yat the parish of Yattenden and Frilshire. This is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry, you have to declare it to me or to Andy afterwards. But let's just pray for this couple, shall we? Heavenly Father, we pray for Martin and for Jane, as they come together in marriage. Be with them in their preparation, Lord. Draw them to you. May they have a wonderful day, which they will remember for the rest of their lives. 
And Lord, may they, may they walk with you into the future. Through this marriage, may they come to know you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we've got some notices as well, quite a number of them. We're coming to that season when it's time for our annual parochial church meeting. It's going to be on the 30th of April at 7.30 in here. It's the time when we elect new members to our PCC and church wardens and hear a bit more about the way our church is being run. If you would like to be able to vote at that meeting, then you need to fill in an electoral roll form if you haven't already. For those of you who've already done it, we're not in that fifth year when we have to do the whole lot, so don't worry about that for the moment. But today is the last day that you can fill in that form. So if you want to do that, you must do it today, and you need to go online to our website and look for the electoral roll form on our website. Uh, the news, the uh, news email has a link to it as well if you want to go and find it that way. And please be praying for our APCM. We need members for our PCC, a church warden, a treasurer, a number of people we need to support our church. So please be praying into that as we come towards that. Uh, another notice um, on the, this coming Friday at 2 o'clock, we have a Thanksgiving service in here for dear Stephen Bishop, who most of us have known for a very long time. So do come and give your thanks for Stephen's life. Now, on, we've got some summer holidays coming up, one sort or another. I think we have a slide, have we, Johnny? Should have, there they are. I'm not going to go through them all, but if you have children or grandchildren who would like to become involved in one of those, then the way to find it again is to go to our website where there are links for bookings. Do you know how bookings are going, Johnny, at all? Have you heard anything? Yeah. There's still space, but I think it's, it's okay. So that's good. And then one more. A date for your diary, Thursday the 25th of April at 7 o'clock, is Canaan's annual get-together, Thanksgiving and AGMs. It's being held this year at Kingdom Living Church. If you don't know where that is, it's up at the other end of Leyland Parish, the old Methodist church that used to be, well, it still is, in, um, in, in the end of Leyland there. And thankfully, Father Desmond has offered to, uh, to have us that evening. So um, that'll be a wonderful evening, hearing all about Canaan's work and being able to pray for Canaan. So do come along. 25th of April, 7 o'clock. I think that's all the notices, unless anyone's waving their hands at me and saying, you've forgotten something. No, I haven't forgotten something. Okay, jolly good. Well, we come to our final hymn then. And you know, Johnny was talking about what it would be like to come to that beach in the dawn treader or come into the presence of the Lord at the end of our lives. And the one thing I think we will probably do is what it says at the first verse of this hymn. At your feet we fall mighty risen Lord. I think we'll be so overawed by being in God's presence and Jesus' presence that all we'll want to do is to fall down in worship. Let's stand and sing this song together in Jesus' name.
do be seated for a final prayer. By the way, Johnny, you told us earlier that we'd come to the end of our series in John's Gospel. Actually, we haven't quite. There's a doxology tonight. We're going to be thinking about Peter's reinstatement, but nevertheless. So do come along. If you want that last little bit, come along. 5.30 this afternoon, and we'll have another think about that. Let's say together the words of the morning collect. They should be on, yes, they are on the screen. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.